The On Time Podcast is an enthusiast forum dedicated to horology. There will be strong opinions, potentially foul language, and if you don't like it, with all due respect, listen to something else. Our opinions are not bought or paid for. This is intended for a mature audience. If you decide to keep listening, there will be picture references of the watch being discussed displayed along with the audio. Sit back and enjoy the beat. Okay, hey guys, welcome to the very, very first episode, the inaugural episode of On Time Podcast, brought to you by Watch Geeks for Watch Geeks. Welcome to our podcast. This is Mike. This is Chase. Let's introduce the show here. Let's do it. Why are we here? What are you listening to? On Time is a product indirectly, really, of the LA Watch Gang. It's no big surprise that everyone sitting in the room here, on air or off, is from the gang. And what we all realized is that there was a void in this space for uh, an entertaining and informative platform that's also interactive. There are plenty of places to go listen to one person give their opinion about something or something else. But this is going to take a round table format and that's the kind of the key here. Yeah, literally we're sitting at a round table. It's going to be co-hosted. We're going to bring on interesting guests that are really salient to watches and to horology in all aspects. Sitting around at the at one of our many get-togethers, we're talking about what really is missing. And what is missing is a good podcast in this space, in the watches neurology space, talking about all different aspects that's not necessarily focused on just analyzing one watch or just doing a news redux, but this is a real roundtable interactive platform. So what we set out to produce is how can we bring people into this and bring the fun that we all experience and we look forward to every month and bring it onto the air on a more regular schedule so we can wet our palates in between. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. So just so you guys know, first of all, thank you, everybody who's listening. And just so you guys know, we're probably going to do this on a monthly basis at first, and then we're going to probably increase the frequency as things go along. But we'll go into a little bit more of the introduction, I guess, because people got to know who they're talking on the air, right? Exactly. Yeah. So Now they know what we're doing, they want to know who's doing it. Exactly, exactly. It's not like we're just a whole bunch of Joe Schmoes that wear Invictas, you know, that sit around the table <laughs> and then go, or maybe not. Okay. Anyway, onwards. I guess what I'll do is I'll just transition to why I like watches. Uh, <laughs> You know, I basically grew up with them, for the most part. I got a little pocket watch from my great-grandfather that survived World War II, and also the Soviets, which in some ways are scarier than Can the definitely Nazis be scarier. Yeah. If we get some complaints our first time around, that's not going to be a bad thing, right? No, it means we've done something right. Yeah, we're trying to piss some people off, right? We will. Okay, good. But anyway, my first experiences with watches were with that pocket watch. I, for some strange reason, was always really attracted to, you know, micro mechanics. I played with Legos, and obviously not the most micro mechanic type of thing, but if I could build it, I would love it. If I could take it apart and then potentially put it back together, which is probably not going to happen or even till this day, that's a great thing for me. So that's why I love watches, the micro mechanics, the aesthetics, just sometimes the simplicity. My collection, or collection in quotes, is very, very simple. I don't really have anything overly complicated here. When I was a kid, the only thing that I would ask for, for a birthday, for a special occasion, whatever it was, was a watch. And everybody always looked at me weird. Everybody, including my parents. And then I came to find out that actually my family's roots, my family's last name, actually means clock and is related to you know, like timekeeping in Hebrew. Because we're from, you know, like uh, Austria, my roots are. So it's really difficult for me to explain it. It's something that I'm always, always fascinated by. We were talking about some guys, how they kind of have that little burnout. They just can't do watches anymore or for whatever reason they get turned off a little i've never had that i've always had the attraction to watch okay so chase since you kind of had the microphone before and you told us about what we're going to do why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into watches well i have liked watches for almost as long as i can remember why i like them there are several reasons one uh, of course from an aesthetic standpoint from an engineering standpoint they're completely fascinating. I love machines. The other machines I like happen to be cars. So what I like specifically about watches, what makes me passionate about them, is that the watches are kind of a modern product. It's the end product of what is the most important thing, what almost makes us human. It's our ability to measure time and the ability to understand time. 
That ability is unique to our species in a way we can understand it and divide it and measure it so precisely. And it's the reason that it underlies everything that we do. Every science, every piece of engineering, whether it's the space program, whether it's the ability to build cars or houses, if we can't measure time, we can't do anything. And I think that so many people take that for granted, just knowing what time it is. It's something that 300 years ago, you actually had to walk to the middle of your town to go see the one clock that was there to know what time it was. Right. Now people just dismiss watches and clocks as commonplace, but this was kind of the most important thing our species did that transformed us from bumbling around and you know, basically screwing around with crude machines to being able to do everything that we do today. Right. And so the watches is a wonderful example of where it's like the art of humanity. It's aesthetics and it's engineering and it's science and it's the origin of modern humanity all rolled into one that you can appreciate and wear with you every day. And it, you can use it to express your own personal style and personality. That was deep. That was really, really deep. Okay. I, I, I feel inferior, but no, uh, that's, oh, that's my thanks, super Andrew. nerdy side coming yeah, out. Super nerdy side. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, guys, without further ado, I want to introduce you to someone. He is a, a dear friend of mine. I'm, I'm very fortunate to call him a dear friend of mine. And he's one of the most respected collectors in the Los Angeles area. He's got a very vast collection and he's been through it all. Everything from vintage to modern to what we'll talk about is his holy trinity now. Uh, Mr. Andrew also known as uh, jlee5050 on Instagram. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any significance behind that? Well, the reason why I chose 5050 was I'm old enough, I guess, to be a kid of the analog era. So we used to carry around pagers, you know, like little drug dealers. And we all had to identify each other. And my code was 5050. So if you were friends with me back in the day and you got a code saying 5050, then it was me. So now we know the significance behind it. So Mr. Andrew, J. Lee 5050. Yes, sir. The infamous, one of the OGs of the OGs of the LA Watch Am I game. the OG of the OGs? Yes. Oh, okay. Definitely. Well, thank you. I mean, not sure if I really deserve that title, but oh, you you know, do. I, I would gladly take it and of course. say thanks. You know, why not? <laughs> if you're going <laughs> to well, call me an OG, I've never been called an OG. Because oh, first of all, I don't have any tattoos. I've never been to jail. And uh, <laughs> I think that in order to be an OG in the criminal underworld, I guess, you have to kind of pay your dues, but I've never really done that. I think we can express it really well. I actually wrote this earlier. I'll just, I'll read right off what I wrote here. The best thanks we can give is to have one of its founding members, it being the LA Watch Gang, who happens to be a fantastic collector that has earned our highest respect as our inaugural guest. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I... I don't really know what else to say. I, you guys are putting me on the spotlight. So. I'm, I'm balling out of control right now. And then I don't mean by, <laughs> you know, balling like... Yeah, because a, I'm just not really used to this. You know, I'm, I guess I don't take praise too well. You know, I've... You, you certainly deserve it, man. You really do. You definitely uh, don't give yourself enough credit for putting this whole thing together. I mean, well, it's, you know, it's, it's not, obviously not just you. But, you know, I always say it's, it's our group. You know, I mean, right. it's not really like my group per se, or sure. it's our group. We all started it. So it's, you know, I always say it's for the collector, by the collector. And what's a better way to get together with people with like minds and meet up and knock back a few beers and fondle each other's watches. Okay. I'm glad you finished <laughs> that up with each other's watches. I would have gone in a very, very oh, strange yeah. direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I wanted to actually talk to you about is the history of the gang and how it really all started. Because you're one of the founders and you were there from the beginning. Right. Tell us a little bit about how the whole thing came together. Because if I remember correctly, the first kind of off the books, let's say, GTG was that day in Pasadena between you and a couple of other... Yeah, members. it was me, you, it was couple, Brian, yeah, yeah, Brian, Brian and, and Jimmy, a couple other guys, right. us four. And the hashtag actually just kind of started as a joke because, of course, the famous Red Bar crew in New York started calling themselves crew. So I thought it was fitting. Oh, okay. New York crew, mafia, L.A. gang. Why not? <laughs> and, and with Fair all enough. due respect to the Red Bar crew, I think our group's just a little younger on average. So I was like, okay, we'll just call ourselves a gang. And I started using the hashtag. It was a start as a joke. And I started threatening other members. I'm going to jump them in. <laughs> which, which never really happened, but you know, yeah, just, there's always, yeah, there's always you know, potential. Sort of, in the you future. know, just as a joke, just based on the gang culture that we have here in Southern California. So, started doing that, 
and then、um, more and more people started showing up through Instagram, and that's it. Just kind of took off from there. And the reason why I think it was started was we're the second biggest city in America, and we don't have anything like that. So I was like, why not? Let's just do it. That's it, pretty、yeah. much. In the story. Yeah, that's a great story. It's kind of tough for us, though. We'd love to get together as much as Red Bar does, but we kind of have this thing called the freeway. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I do it for I do it for the gang. Exactly. Because I've been jumped in. Respect. Hashtag respect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, blood in, blood out, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about what makes you tick. <laughs> <laughs> What makes me tick?、What、well, I'm just gonna be honest. I mean, you know, I'm a kid from the analog era. You know, I was born in the '70s. It was more of a habit for me, just wearing a watch. And of course, it was sort of a necessity because we didn't have no cell phones in our pockets, and you、mm-hmm. know, it was it was a day of Saturday morning cartoons, and after that, it was Soul Train, which came on, and <laughs> you knew it was over. Yeah, it was sort of out of necessity. I think every kid's been through a swatch phase. Those were one of my、uh, first watches. Went through a couple of those, and then my most memorable one was actually a Guess watch, and it had the Indiglo feature. I don't know if you're、oh, yeah, familiar with that. You press a button, and the whole dial lights up like this. Yeah, yeah. Timex, aqua, right? Timex and blue. And,、uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, right. So I had wore that for a while, and my uncle was gracious enough to trade me his Tag Heuer. He had a Tag Heuer diver. He traded you a Tag Heuer、yeah. for a guest watch. Wow!、But、at first, I didn't know how nice Tag Heuer was, but all I know is I liked his watch. And all I know is my uncle sucked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I never had I, an uncle try to do a trade like that. <laughs> yeah, but apparently he liked the the little blue light feature, and he was like, "Hey, I'll trade you." And I was like, "Okay,、oh, hey, right. wow." Yeah, my uncle just give me a firm handshake, call me an asshole, and go on the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know,、um, I guess I should be so fortunate.、Right? Should, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I wore that for a little bit, and maybe I got a little older, and then、um, I just wanted to get back in, and I was like, I want a watch, but I want a mechanical watch, and I was aware that watches were mechanical back in the day, not battery powered, as everyone just kind of assumed. My first mechanical watch was a vintage Breitling. Really? And then, yeah, I started off with vintage. I tell everyone that. Yeah. Bought a three eBay, came in the mail, loved it to death, and then did some research on it, and then I posted photos on the forums. Later, I found out it was redial. Yeah, we've we've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> Multiple times. Very very disappointed. So I, you know, I bought it first on my money, and I sold it for like less than half of that. But you live and learn, right?、Yeah. It's a process. So. After that, it's all been kind of downhill from there. So I mean, downhill, <laughs> downhill, <laughs> downhill, 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 brightly. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I mean, you know, we all gotta start somewhere, though, right?、Yeah. I tell everyone, your collection's gotta start somewhere. You know, you unless you're some oil baron or some Middle Eastern prince, you have collectors like us. We have limited funds. Right. With limited funds, you have to trade in a lot. Sometimes you lose money. Sometimes maybe you might come up, but I just chalk it up all as experience. I just like to say, oh, I got to own that watch for a little bit, and、right. you know, get my experience. And you're sharpening your teeth, basically, in yeah, the collection. Yeah, exactly.、Work. You know, but I think in the end, I don't think it really ends. Yeah, yeah. There's always going to be something new. Yeah, there's always going to be something new. There's always going to something that you want to upgrade to. After about seven or eight years of collecting, I think I'm a little settled down now, and I'm a little more focused on what I want. I'm not really all over the place. Do you remember which Breitling it was? You know what? I yeah, I don't really remember because I guess I was just so traumatized by it. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I guess that's the right word. Yeah, it wasn't really too memorable, but I guess it's like going to a supermarket and trying a brand of crackers that you never tried, and apparently that one just sucked. So how long did you have it? I've had it for about yeah about six seven months. Yeah, and then after that, I just dumped it. So, so someone on the forum posted there was a redial, or you actually yeah, came to the research? Was, yeah, but I posted the photos on the forum, and you know, there was some vintage bridling specialists, dudes that really knew their stuff, and sure, yeah, they gave me their input. You know, obviously they weren't dicks about it or anything, but yeah, just you know, you chalk it up as you live and learn. So, so what was the first watch that you bought that you? Were really ecstatic about, and you stayed satisfied with it. The one that just kept on giving. Probably gonna shamelessly say it was my first Rolex. I bought a two-tone Air King Date, which is still very. That's super rare. Yeah, it's. See, I don't like to use the word rare. I it mean, is. rare is hard to find. Is that is that a better word? Yeah, I like to use hard to find or uncommon. All right. Yeah, I think、That's、rare kind of gets thrown around a little too often. Yeah, it was uncommon, but it was a two-tone. I bought it from a dealer in downtown LA. 
my first probably major purchase totally enamored with it and then later on i traded it in for something else and i do kind of regret it now but what'd you trade it for i traded it in for a jaeger which i'm not quite sure if i should have done it but i mean jaegers are good watches too that different, they definitely are yeah different type of watch yeah definitely a different type of watch you know like i said another experience right We'll talk about Jaeger in detail. I think they're going to be a good focus for us just because I think we all generally are all on the same page. And movements for us are pretty big. It's you know, a big it, deal. Yeah, it's oh, a yeah. big deal. Definitely. Movement does play a big deal. Yeah, and who's a better company to talk to or talk about than Jaeger when it comes to movements? Right. Yeah. So in your collecting career, was there something that ever happened where you actually made you maybe a little bit less passionate or some expectation that you had, just something didn't live up to what you had hoped. One particular watch or maybe one particular thing even shifted your perception. I don't really think so, to be honest. For me, it's always just been about the journey. And every watch and every get together, every person, every collector that I got to meet, you know, within our group, or even outside of Instagram, it's I chalk it up as just a learning experience. So, you know, nothing like that. Well, I had an experience like that, and I'm sure that either of you can remember what your thoughts were when you found this out, because it's not something that you realize going into watches. The most significant negative experience that I had with watches was when I realized that most watch companies weren't actually building the whole watch, they were just making a case, and that so many pieces were just a case all around the same movement, and that so many of them were just all the same thing inside. It felt so generic to me. I felt like I was lied to and I was being deceived, and all these companies are putting their name on these pieces, and they're not really making them. They're designing them, and maybe they're making the case and the dial, but that's not the whole deal. And we touched on it a little bit before that the movement is such a key point to any watch, to a collector. The movement will always be important. So I just wonder from the two of you, if you remember what you thought or how it changed your perspective. No, I mean, like I said, of course, like you, I've learned that, you know, as well. Before, I just kind of thought, oh, one watch brand and they make that watch. Yeah, and course. then later I found out that, oh, so for example, a $3,000 Breitling will use the same movement as a $1,000 Hamilton. You know, it kind of does change your perception. It can. But yeah, it wasn't really much of a deal breaker, to be honest. As you know, the Swiss have always been more of a collective society, so they kind of feed off of each other. So you buy a part from one company, and then mm -hmm. you buy another part from another company, and then some parts you make in-house, and then you put it together, but in the end, you slap your brand on it. And then there are obviously some really crazy mofos, you know, that do everything in-house. Like, you know, like Roger Smith? Yeah, like that guy is pretty insane. Yeah, he's, he's out of control right Dude now. Dude welds his own cases, yeah. you know. It, Rose gold and just... Yeah, it's just so incredible. I mean, you know, you have that spectrum. Of course, you have a company like Rolex who's... I would say probably like 99% vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. It's not like I was like super disappointed or anything. I mean, I've always learned how... And after you learn, it's like, okay, well, I guess that's what it is. So, but nowadays, everyone, I think a lot of these brands are so caught up with the whole in-house branding. Oh, we make this and we make that. Well, they have to differentiate themselves somehow because there's just so much competition. There's watches that are coming out that 20 years ago, even with the type of R&D and production costs, it wouldn't have been possible. True, true. But in the end, though, I mean, I think if you like it, then you should just buy it. No, that's all that matters to me. Pocket so, willing. Yeah. Or pocket, checkbook pocket willing, willing. Whichever yeah. way you want to. Yeah, pocket willing. Yeah. yeah. Let's put it this way. When you buy a car, let's say you buy a Mercedes, right? You're not buying everything Mercedes. The glass is made by someone, right? Right, well, exactly. The spark plugs are made by someone. But they're also made to spec. The they one are. thing I can tell you, having a background in the auto industry, is that they're not comparable because with very, very few instances, you will sometimes have one company that's supplying an engine to another car manufacturer and you'll have platform sharing within a manufacturer. But it's not like, for example, every single car on the road is using a GM engine except for a small handful. Right. Whereas that is the case with watches that, let's say a rough number, 90% of watch companies don't make movements, they make cases and dials. Right. No, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, it's, definitely. If you're looking at from that standpoint, as a true collector, someone who's been doing this a long time, and someone who has a true passion about these, for someone who is maturity-wise, collecting maturity-wise, someone who's maybe a step or two below... I don't want to make us sound super high and mighty, but someone who's a little bit less involved with watches. 
they're not going to care about that as, as much. No, they're not. Oh, no. They're not. It's not going to matter to them. Right. Because to them, I think it's more about aesthetics first. Sure. You know, they're going to buy what they're seeing. I'll be honest. For me, it's aesthetics first, and then it's the price. And if the price justifies whatever's inside, then that watch is a contender. Many brands you'll hear me bash. I just don't get. One of them, I hate to say this, is IWC. It's my brand. Everybody knows this. I'm a big IWC guy. I have one. I'm going to eventually pick up one, maybe not a blue dial. We'll, we'll talk about it no, later. No, blue dial's mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we know. It's mine. Slate dial, uh, perpetual Stay away candle. From that one. Right. But when it comes to something like that, or a company like that, rather, I just don't get it. They have pieces that are approaching the $10,000 range. And they're not in-house watches. And I know you said that everybody's kind of on this in-house kick. When you're coming up to those prices, they should be. They have to be. Because where is your value at that point? Because they're not using any type of materials that are precious. You know, they're not really doing anything other than just putting it down on paper. And yeah, they're cutting the case. And many of these guys don't even make their own cases. Oh, no. You know, so at that point, anywhere between, let's say, four and 9000 if it's not in-house, then to me, it's just an exercise in making a shit ton of money for the company. And they just don't really give a but shit what about if, the collector. like, you really, really, really liked it? You mean the aesthetics of it? Yeah. If it was perfect for like you, you have to have it. Like, then you yeah, just you yeah. just buy it. Yeah, sure. Well, okay. there's plenty of watches that I like that are in that price category that I wouldn't buy because I can't justify spending that type of money for them. Do you know what the great thing is about those watches? Is that generally speaking, the ones we're talking about where you just love the aesthetics, but really you, there's no way you can justify the price is that they're going to have such terrible resale value. Yeah. You can almost certainly pick one up secondhand for pennies and a dollar. Yeah, and that's probably what I would do. Mm -hmm. And I've done that. I've looked at watches that just drop in price. You know, it's like driving off, what do they say? Like a Ferrari, the minute you drive it off, it's, or what car? What, what, am, I, what am I? Yeah, Jag. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was looking for it. Thanks. You know, you, the minute you drive a Jag off the lot, you lose 50% of its value. So yeah, I get it. And I wouldn't pick up a Jag even secondhand, although right now they're getting a little bit better. Not Man, too much. Jags of are sexy. Those they're they sexy, are. right. But An that's XJS exactly the point. Come on. Right. Those are sexy. But would you drive one? No, would you go I would. through? I would. Okay. I would definitely drive one. Depends. Well, it depends which one. None of that Ford crap. I want the old Lucas <laughs> Electronics when they were built by commies in England. Yeah. The, the minute that you turn a switch and if it's... <laughs> yeah, just catch on fire. Exactly. Yeah. If you're trying to turn on the uh, windshield wipers, your gas cap explodes and then there's smoke coming out from the bottom of the car. That type of jag. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't see Smokey that type of shit. better, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just like, like you know, some people's whiskeys. Okay, well, let me ask you this. You can be a collector and have one watch. How many watches do you have? Knew you were going to ask me that. Um, okay, currently at the moment, I'm probably going to say 14. Probably. Yeah, I, that's just like at the top of my head. But I'm trying to count everything in my head. And I'm, yeah, 14 is my final answer. Okay, yeah. final answer. Yeah. I like that. What was, uh, what was the biggest collection that you had what, what, as far as numbers are concerned? Yeah, I probably at one point I had about 20, but most of them were, um, I would say five or six were, you know, a little substantial and the rest were just kind of for play. Real, some budget pieces, but I love all pieces equally. So I don't really discriminate. My tastes aren't really picky either. Right. I mean, if you notice the way I've been collecting, so. Well, they're not picky, but they're definitely fairly focused. You're not all over the place. There's a few collectors, even a few collectors that are in our group, and there's nothing wrong with being all over the place. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, there's so many watch brands out there. I think life is too short just mm -hmm. to mess around with one brand, to be honest. I completely agree. Maybe it could just be a sort of a personal thing or deep inside someone's a douchebag and all they collect is vintage Rolex, you know, <laughs> or something, you know, like, or just one particular type of niche. By the way, no offense to vintage Rolex owners, but yeah. <laughs> That's a disclaimer. <laughs> we know we know. there's a few yeah. out there. Yeah, there are. But anyway, I mean, I think life is too short just to stick with one brand. I want to explore all brands. And so many brands have contributed to the art, really, to pushing it forward, that I think it's almost irresponsible to ignore everyone but one. Right. If you collect it, if you love watches, you can see something you love and the name shouldn't matter. Definitely. I agree. It is what it is. So You would never sell off all of your pieces. And let's say that you get to a point where all you want to collect is paddock. Would you ever get well, to that Well, I mean, point? I guess now that I've kind of thought about my whole the entire road that I've been down, I was sort of brand specific for a while. Yeah, I've kind of been through that too. I started off with vintage bridling. And for a while, that's all I started collecting. Why? I don't know. At that time, prices were still fairly affordable, I guess, to their counterparts. Let's say Hoyer and Omega. They were a little bit cheaper, I would say, on average at that time. 
And at one point, I have about like nine, ten vintage bridlings. And I thought, oh, I, I think maybe I found my love. But after that, you start wearing other people's pieces, and then you're like, oh, actually, that's kind of cool. And then you want to try it, but something's got to go out, so you sell that. So that's kind of how it changed, you know.、Yeah. So, and then that's when I realized,、oh, okay, I guess there is more to the watch world than just one type of niche or one type of brand. So, yeah, and that's the kick-ass portion of the LA Watch Gang, where we can go to a GTG and spot something and go, hey, you want to wear this for a month and swap with me? Right, and that goes for not just for our get-togethers, but I'm sure for all the other get-together groups out there in watch world. So. That's like the whole point. Sure, big、yeah. swingers club, exactly. Yeah, swingers club. Except we don't swing. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> we, quote unquote, we don't know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> we don't know that. There's certain members of our group that are questionable. Oh, okay. All right. And in a multitude of their actions, so we well, won't well, name them I'll now. The you will, sure. But when we get <clears throat> them onto the podcast, I'm sure we can discuss their activities in both ways. Yeah, sure. Why not? Take a little bit of a tangent. So the big question, of course, that everyone has. Probably asked you or wanted to ask you at some point, and it's really ironic that you're wearing the vintage Seamaster 300 today because it's one of the only exceptions to this rule that、mm-hmm. I know of. What's with the blue? I know it's、um, your microphone's even blue. Yeah, I know. It's kind of <laughs> <laughs> well, blue. I mean, you know, we just know you so well. Yeah, the Dodgers are blue, which are my favorite team. Sure. No, the color blue just all started with a Seiko Five that I had. Seiko Five. Yeah, Seiko Five. It was a blue dial. It was like sort of this sunburst blue dial.、And、I was like, that's a really great color for a watch. And then one of our main members, he picked up a Royal Oak Jumbo. About last year, I believe, early last year.、Uh, Mr. LA Watch Guy. Yes, sir. Dar, if you're listening, what's up? But anyway, oh, went, we'll make him listen. <laughs> he he lent it to me, gracious enough, four days, and after that, I was pretty sold. But at that time, it was more like not really about the color; it was more about the watch. That's a pretty special watch. Yeah, but even before that, I have another disclaimer. I despised Royal. I didn't like it. I was like, "What the hell is this? What is it? Octagonal?、Right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, octagonal piece of shit. It's like got screws." <laughs> And I was like, well, "What's so special about this?" And then, obviously, he lent it to me, and within four days, I was sold. And I did a huge consolidation. Yeah, three fairly major pieces plus cash, and I picked up my own. And that one, of course, everyone knows, has sort of a deep navy, shiny blue dot. Yeah. And at the same time, I had a crazy obsession. The Nautilus five seven one two, and that was sort of like my grail for many many years. Ever since I got back into collecting. And I was like, I gotta have that watch. And I noticed. And then when you start immersing in this hobby, of course, by default, I'm not gonna say it's gospel, but the holy trinity of watchmaking is obviously PP, AP, and VC.、Right? Well, I mean, there's a lot of people that would question that, right? At this point, of course. But I'm but just saying, for you, know, you will just say, yeah, yeah. I hate to say be that, politically correct, correct, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, some people will put long game there. And some people, including put, me, <laughs> yeah, some people would put another brand. But for me, it was that's how I evolved. Just kind of thinking that's like the holy trinity. So I was like, okay, well, and then I ended up buying the Patek also. I was like, oh, maybe I should do a holy trinity. So I just ended up buying another, my final piece, the Vacheron, overseas, and that one just just blue as well. And then that's how it just kind of started that whole blue obsession. After that, a Tudor Heritage Chronograph. After that, Hamilton Pan Europe. After which that, which is a great piece. That's such an underrated piece. Yeah, very awesome. So much watch for the money. I mean, twelve hundred bucks can't、yeah. beat it. And it's decorated, and it feels hefty. Yeah, that watch pre- feels pretty no substantial. No doubt, no doubt. And I just recently picked up an IWC Aqua Timer. Yeah, I believe. No, actually, yeah, it's an Aqua Timer Cousteau Divers. That's right. Well, everyone kind of dubs it the John Mayer, because on the first episode of Talking Watches, he came out with one. So. Yeah, that was my latest one that I picked up. That、and、dial then, is absolutely killer. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a deep navy sunburst blue dial. Yeah, it almost got, looks like a porcelain type of. Yeah, kind of. Has an yeah, iridescence to it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, a little bit. So yeah, basically that's how my whole blue obsession began, and I just figured, you know what? Why not keep going? And after that, I just kind of decided, oh, I'm just okay. Now I want to stick to blue dials. So that's how I'm kind of staying on the course now, just more focused on what I want. So I've got a little shopping list, you know. Yeah, <laughs> as we all do. Oh yes. I think a good way to start off here, Andrew, is. 
tell us about any other vices you might have besides watches. Well, I think, first of all, every guy should have a vice. If you don't have a vice, I don't think you're a dude. Yeah. Just chop your balls off. Like, <laughs> I mean, every guy should have a vice, unless you're Ned Flanders or something like that. But yeah, obviously I smoke cigarettes. I've been smoking for quite a while. People ask me the obvious question, are you going to quit? Not sure if I want to, to be honest. Just being honest, I'm not sure if I can't. Well, the answer is, if you don't want to, you're not going to. Yeah, but then, realistically speaking, I think I should. Well, yeah, I mean, everybody thinks they should quit smoking, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I've cut down on my drinking. I mean, I'm drinking tonight, <laughs> but no, I'm serious. I, Come I cut on, down man. A lot Why on did you drink. cut down on your drinking? You're so much more fun when you drink. Yeah, I am. Yeah, and my wallet opens up much easier, too. <laughs> I, I'm just like a girl, except I don't open my legs, you know? I open my wallet. <laughs> and I always want to go sing, yeah. which I haven't done with anybody yet. Oh, yeah. well, any of you guys, yeah. Oh, you That's just a revelation. Up a whole I get drunk. Yeah, every time I get drunk, it's like, yeah, let's go to karaoke. Koreatown, you know? So I know what the plan is for the next get oh, together. Yeah. 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 yeah, we should go karaoke. Yeah, definitely. we're going to get shitty and sing some shitty. <laughs> definitely, we go. Yeah. So drinking is not really necessarily your vice, right? Your, no. your cigarettes are. My true vice, I would say, obviously, is watches. I Watch. tell everyone it's the only hobby that helps me keep sane no. in right. my own little insane world, sure. I guess. That's hard to qualify as a vice, though. It's a noble It's a very endeavor. expensive vice. It is, but you think of yourself as a patron of the arts. <laughs> You're too nice, Chase. <laughs> He's so eloquent. He's so goddamn eloquent. You should write a book about just nonsense, but it sounds uh, so nonsense. goddamn no, you're good. You're so nice. <laughs> Such a nice guy. Thank you. Okay, let's talk more watches, because I want to go kind of a little deeper into your holy trinity, one of them being the AP. The 15202 is always on your wrist. It's not always, but for the majority of the GTGs, it always shows up. Well, maybe not as of yeah, late. Yeah, fair, um, fair to say, yeah. yeah. That overseas has made a lot of appearances, actually. It has, yeah. yeah and yeah, so, yeah. so well, is the 5712. Little... I would have a hard time picking out what he wears the most. Well, I can tell you that before the overseas came into the picture and before the 5712 came into the picture, the 15202 was always head honcho. Yeah, exactly, because it's the one that started it all. Ah, that's important. Yeah. yeah, I tell collectors too, it's always easy to play, I guess, if we were to talk about price, which I don't really like doing, but... If you were to talk about price within a certain price range, it's the first watch that I broke the five-figure mark. And at that time, it was a shitload of money for me. And I wasn't even quite sure if I should be spending this kind of money. Yeah, well, that's always, that's every watch purchase, I think, for, for most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, it's just like with everything, just like with every vice. Yeah. There's a first time for everything, and after that, the second time and third time gets easier. So everything just becomes downhill. You think you'd ever sell it? I don't think so, unless... I would probably do an upgrade within the same brand, but my upgrade is like uber expensive. And like we're talking Torbion. like, yeah, like the Royal Oak Turbian. Okay. You guys will notice a pattern with me. I'm not a huge fan of AP in general, but damn, that thing is a pretty son of a bitch right there. I even actually thought about doing a quote unquote small upgrade to the rose gold version, but oh. I have a feeling someone would probably chop my arms off after. <laughs> or yeah for that piece so yeah i'm just trying to make myself less of a target so i just figure i have to stick with steel mm -hmm. okay so you were talking about this at the gtgs the whole precious metals thing and you want a precious metals piece right because yes, i don't I think do. you have anything precious metals right no now. i've never actually owned one i've owned two tone combo that counts that's still there's enough precious in it it's not like just pushers or just hands right if it's a legitimate two-tone piece that counts as being precious yeah yeah but like what i meant was like a full precious metal. right the entire thing is just like glowing off your wrists you yeah know? when you're walking around your left hand or whatever you wear your watch it feels kind of tired yeah i love precious the actress <laughs> what no sorry i'm just being a smart ass okay as i usually am okay no actually i'm just completely obsessed with lord of the rings <laughs> <laughs> No, I love precious metals. My favorites are probably rose gold and platinum. Although one of my favorite pieces, as maybe uninteresting as it is, but I still am completely in love with it, one of my grails that I know once I buy it, I will probably never sell it, would be a Tridor. And if you don't know what the Tridor is, this was the only time that I'm aware of in Rolex's history that they've done a day date in a multicolor metal. So it had a white gold case and it had a president bracelet where the outer links were in white gold. But the center link on the bracelet was a combination of rose, yellow, and white. And it was in a striped pattern. That yeah, went like a all ribbon. Around the, a, yeah. Exactly, like a ribbon all the way around the watch. 
the watches are surprisingly unloved. They really don't command much of a premium over a single color day date, but it has always appealed to me. I've always loved that piece. And again, that's just the exception that piece is for me is that it's the only white gold piece that I've ever really lusted over. And what do those things run for now? It really depends. They're yeah. about 13, 13, 14. It depends yeah. how clean. With any precious piece, what the valuation is going to depend really heavily on the wear. And of course, with the Rolex bracelets, especially a precious Rolex bracelet, the stretch is going to be sure. the key. Okay. I'd take uh, Chocolate Daytona. Chocolate Daytona? That's all Boring. I need. Chocolate Daytona. That yeah. was sort of my, uh, well, it's still one of my favorites too, but ever since I got blue fever, it's just, <laughs> I, I just can't do it. So Frank can watch it. Yeah. I thought of that. Picking up a blue Daytona dial, but it's not the same. I don't know how that's going to look. I don't know yeah, how that's going to look. Yeah, it's not going to look too great. You, you mean know? a Playtona? Playtona. Oh, that's hot fire. Well, that's like a glacier blue. And, oh, yeah. That's, but oh, it's gorgeous. come on. Yeah. Uh, no, no. It's got to be Dodger blue. We we know. No, no, no. No, the glacier blue is it's pretty pimp. I'm going to admit. It's pimp. Definitely. Is that OG, definitely, OG coming out? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fuck off piece in my it opinion. Is, yeah. So if you like blue, what do you think of Soda Light? Soda Light. I'm more of a lapis. More of guy. a lapis. Yeah. All right. Lapis, maybe, uh, maybe out of the exotic stones, maybe more of a aventurine but i'm more of a lapis guy yeah because it's like electric blue that is true definitely electric blue i personally i like the soda light but i'm not the king of the blues that's for sure and the other hand what i do like with the exotic dials i'll do almost anything for malachite in fact i have definitely dreamt about a malachite dial on that tridor i have no idea what's going on right now <laughs> it's okay you just sit i quiet. do I, yeah i'm just gonna look pretty as i always do Are there any pieces that you regret selling? Ah, the regret question. Of course. Yes. The $64,000 question. It's so serious we're whispering it. Well, you know, I mean, like I say, gangsters don't regret. We boogie. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it, no, no. I mean, you know, I try to live life in general with no regrets. Obviously, that's very difficult. But, you know, we all make mistakes. We're human. All right. How about the one that got away? That way you don't have to say you regret it. No, not really. I think I've always been fortunate that I've been able to buy what I want at that time. Or luckily, I just didn't see it. I just didn't catch it. And then later on, I found out someone else bought it. And I'm like, oh, shit. You know, but yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, really no regrets. There are a couple, maybe one or two pieces I kind of regret selling. Like I said, my first Rolex, I think I should have kept that one. But obviously, I kind of needed the money for the upgrade. Well, you would have kept it for the sentiment. You wouldn't have kept it for... Yeah, but I think I still would have worn it. Because I just recently picked up an Oyster Date, too. And then that's a small face. You know, right. 34 millimeters. I mm. love it's like that same. Oyster Date. Yeah, it says 34 millimeters. It's a small face, but... Oh, I know how those are. Yeah. You know, the Air King Date that I had, the two-tone. And um, I really, really love... I had a Jaeger Navy SEAL diver. I remember that. The three hen. You brought that on to the, the rubber uh, the first articulated one. bracelet. Yeah. Sick piece, man. That was a kick ass watch. Yeah. Whenever I put that on, I feel like a Navy SEAL. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the power feel, of marketing, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's got the eagle with the trident on the back, yeah. you know? It's just a sick piece. We're so comfortable. I told everyone. I think it was, in a way, sort of a more, not superior, but maybe a good alternative to the ubiquitous Rolex Submariner. Right. They're both equally dive watches, but I just thought it was fantastically designed. Highly legible dial. The bracelet was awesome. Yeah, I really regret selling that one. Yeah, and the minute you put that thing on, you'd feel monstrous. You're like, let's go mess some shit up. Yeah, I wanted to go invade some third world country. Exactly, yeah. What an M4. Exactly. Yeah. Just walk in with no guns, just go pew, pew, pew. <laughs> No, no, you don't want to do that. All right, well, yeah, yeah I don't have much experience in that. It made me look really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so guys, you know, what I'd like to do at this point is we're really upset. Uh, I'll speak for myself. I'm really upset that we have to say goodbye to Andrew, but... Oh, uh, you know, I mean... You'll be back. You will be back. You will definitely be back. There is it's, more to yeah, talk about. It's goodbye, but only temporary. Temporary. I it's like a that see you later. Word. Yeah. 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 So we'll wrap it up here. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Well, actually, no, I'll go back one step. Thank you, Mr. J. Lee 5050 for Most being such an amazing guest. Hey, this was kind of fun, man. Yeah, you it know, was. It's all right. Yeah, it's yeah. all right. So does that mean you would recommend to somebody to be a guest on our show? Yeah, it's not just even with our group. Maybe later on. You can pick someone else from a, another collector group outside of us. That's the goal? Yeah, I think that'd be kind of cool. We're not going to be prejudiced. Yeah. As long as I don't like Invicta, it's fine. Oh, yeah. That means Gary's no go. Oh, okay. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, 
You'll know. We will call him Father Time. Yeah, Father Time. For he is the oldest member of the LA Watch. Oh, yeah. He defines time. Well, you defines, know, I, I, like to, I like to call him the Elder Statesman. Yeah. Yeah, that's like his nickname. I like to call him AARP. <laughs> <laughs> now, Gary is, uh, if there was a role model in the group, it would be Gary. Oh, yeah, definitely. Wonderful. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening to the very first episode of On Time with Mike and Chase. Once again, Mr. Jaylee5050, make sure to follow him on Instagram. Make sure to follow us on Instagram. We will post up our handles later. And obviously, a huge thank you to Mr. Tim Hatayama for being our sound engineer and for Mr. Ken for supervising and providing us with more and more material. Thanks. We're signing off. This is Mike. This is Chase. Thank you for listening to On Time. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to the LA Watch game.